Number 24. Suppose a gas-filled incandescent light bulb is manufactured so that the gas inside the bulb is at atmospheric pressure when the bulb has a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. Letter A. Find the gauge pressure inside such a bulb when it is hot, assuming its average temperature is 60 degrees Celsius. Approximation and neglecting any change in volume due to thermal expansion or gas leaks. So, all right. First thing is we notice that we have a basically a set of changing conditions, right? We have some initial conditions here, and they tell us the pressure right inside the bulb is at atmospheric pressure. Now, if you're confused whether that pressure means absolute pressure or gauge pressure, join the club. All right, it, it's, it's a little confusing from the words. However, if you think about how a light bulb might be manufactured, do you think there's like air added to the inside of the light bulb so that it's like pressurized, right? No, not really. Uh, otherwise, if, if right, and you, and you basically know that this is the case um, because, right, here's your light bulb or whatever this thing is, and you know that when you break a light bulb, there's not like a loud pop. I mean, there's a loud crack because the glass breaks, but there's not like a popping sound, like as if you were to pop a balloon, Right, the balloon has air that's added to the inside of it, whereas the light bulb doesn't have that. Okay, now that being the case, then the gauge pressure inside the balloon at the start, excuse me, inside the light bulb is zero. Right, if you were to take a light bulb and you put like a pressure gauge up to it and you were to read it, you'd see you'd see there's no reading here there's no added pressure inside that light bulb the the pressure inside that light bulb is that atmospheric pressure all right so basically that being said the gauge pressure inside the light bulb at the start is zero okay and the absolute pressure uh, inside that light bulb is going to be equal to atmospheric pressure which is 1.013 times 10 uh, times 10 to the fifth pascals okay keep that in mind these are both the initials all right and it also tells us the initial temperature is going to be 20 degrees Celsius, but, you know, um, we got to convert that into Kelvin, okay? So the Kelvin, I'll write Kelvin initial here. So Kelvin initial is going to be 273 plus then the degree Celsius, which is 20. When we add those together, the initial Kelvin temperature is going to be 293. All right. So we have these values. Now, remember when you plug in pressures into your... Uh, in, uh, ideal gas law formulas or when you plug them into um, your combined gas law formulas, they always have to be an absolute pressure. Take a look at the general video I created on that for ideal gas law. I'll leave a link in the description below. So now the final conditions then, and I'll put it in a different color. So now we have a set of final conditions here uh, where we are going to want to calculate the final gauge pressure. I mean, that's what they asked us. Right? Uh, but in order to do that, we actually have to calculate the final absolute pressure first, okay? And they also told us the final temperature. It's going to be 273 plus then the 60 degrees, right? Because it got hotter. So now when we do that particular math, the Kelvin temperature, the final value is going to be 333, okay? So how do we now relate these together? Remember, we use the combined gas law. We know we're dealing with changing conditions, and therefore... We're going to deal with the initial pressure multiplied by the initial volume divided by the initial mole value times the initial temperature will equal the final pressure times the final volume over the final moles times the final temperature. All right. Now, if they don't mention anything about the, any of these variables, just cancel them. They don't say anything about moles, so take care of moles. Bye-bye. They also say in part A that the volume is constant, and therefore I can cancel that. So... What we arrive at now is we arrive at PI TI will equal PF TF. And we want to solve for that final pressure, right? So we just have to cross multiply, bring this term out of the denominator on the right, and bring it up into the numerator on the left, and look, voila, you just solve for it. Easy peasy. All we got to now do is plug in the values. So the final temperature as we calculated was 333. The initial pressure here was going to be atmospheric, excuse me, absolute pressure. You have to use the absolute pressure value. It's going to be 1.013 times 10 to the fifth Pascal, then divided by the initial temperature of 293, and that will tell us then the final pressure. So let's throw that into the calculator. So 333 times 1.013 times 10 to the fifth divided by 293, and we get now an absolute final pressure. Remember, that's what gets spit out of this equation. Absolute final of 1.15 or so times 10 
to the fifth. All right, that's in Pascals. That's the final pressure. Okay, now that's absolute, not gauge. So how do we find, remember the, the question is finding the gauge pressure. How do we find that? Well, we need to know a relationship between the gauge pressure and the absolute pressure. So you got to memorize this, that the gauge pressure is equal to the absolute pressure minus 1.013 times 10 to the fifth. Okay, these are all in Pascal. So gauge pressure then will be equal to the absolute pressure. We just calculated it, right? We just calculated it to be one, oops, 1 1.15 times 10 raised to the fifth. Subtract out now the 1.013 times 10 to the fifth. And the gauge pressure here will now be one point, uh, we'll take that value. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the exact values here, okay? So if your numbers differ by a slight, slight margin, please don't worry, all right? Uh, so the final values here is going to be, I'm just going to be doing three sig figs. I don't care if there's three or two. Uh, 1.0, uh, excuse me, 1.38 times 10 to the, uh, looks like fourth now, right? Times 10 to the fourth, and that's Pascal. So that's the gauge pressure. If you need it in atmospheres, you can do that conversion. I don't know if you do. So there's Pascal, all right? Um, that's the gauge pressure. And, all right, great. So now... Let's just clear up a little space here. Uh, let me bring my initial absolute pressure. And I should put maybe a little I in there as I realize that now, put a little sub I. Let's remove this. And let's also remove the final Kelvin temperature, okay? All right, so, and let's just clean this up. And then let's take a look at letter B. So now letter B, it says, the actual final pressure of the light bulb will be less than the calculated, than calculated in part A because the glass bulb will expand. Okay, what will the actual final pressure be, taking this into account? So first, let's think. Pretend that this is your light bulb. All right. Uh, looks more like maybe a tree or something, but uh, just pretend it's a light bulb. And... We know that initially the light bulb, let's just say, has this particular shape and size to it. Now we know then in the final state that the light bulb will get hotter, correct? Now, does that mean the light bulb will expand, right? The actual glass part of the light bulb, will the glass expand? Well, yes, right? You have studied the effects of thermal expansion, these three, oops, these three formulas over here. All right, so basically what will happen is we'll take this picture and we're now going to resize it slightly because it now in the final state, it heated up. So maybe it's going to be this big now, okay? So what do we realize? Well, we realize now that the volume contained within the light bulb, which I'll shade over here, and now I'll shade over here, has gone up. Right, the volume inside that container has gone up. The volume inside of the light bulb has gone up. Why? Because the glass has expanded. Now, the gas inside of the container, inside of the light bulb, has also expanded too, and actually would have expanded more at a rate faster than the glass. And then that would have caused maybe a little more pressure. We're not gonna, we're not gonna go there. We're not gonna calculate that, all right? Because this problem, then I'll make a four hour video on it. Um, so what we realize though, is that Gas always takes up the volume of the container it's in, right? So the gas here has this particular volume inside of that glass light bulb, and now the volume inside of that light bulb has expanded because the glass has expanded, all right? So basically, the volume of the gas that's inside of this container is now similar to or found by or however, whatever the right word is, it's now correlated with, there we go, it's now correlated with the volume expansion of the glass bulb itself, okay? So, let me write out the combined gas law again. So we have PI, VI over NI, TI is equal to PF, VF over NF, TF. What we realize again is that they didn't mention anything in terms of the moles, so they just go bye-bye. But the problem now is that the volume has not stayed the same. So we cannot cancel them. So this 
combined gas law basically works out to look something like this now. PF, VF over TF. Again, the goal here is to solve for the final pressure, but we don't know the initial volume and we don't know the final volume. Now, they didn't mention anything about volume in here whatsoever as far as an initial value or a final value, right? So we have nothing to really base our, val our, our volume off of. What, I, what that means to me then is that somehow I'm going to have to cancel these terms. That's what I got to do. Right, I can't really substitute numbers. I, I probably could. I could make up a number, right? We could assume a number. We could do all that. Uh, but a better, probably cleaner mathematical technique will be to try to cancel those terms. Okay? So basically, I'm looking for a relationship between initial volume and final volume. And I also know that the it's going to expand, right? So lo and behold, I'm going to focus on this particular formula over here on the right-hand side. It said that the change in volume, and I'll put this in a different color. The change in volume of a particular, you know, item, in this case we're talking about glass, will be equal to the beta, the thermal coefficient of, uh, the coefficient of thermal expansion for the glass, multiplied by the initial volume. I don't know why they don't put VI here, just know that it's the initial volume. Multiplied then by the change in temperature of that glass. Now you know you can break change up into a final value minus the initial. So it's the final volume minus the initial volume will be equal to the thermal uh, coefficient. Of the, I keep saying thermal first. The coefficient of thermal expansion multiplied by the initial volume multiplied by the change in temperature. Now solve this for VF. Why VF? Just because the math, math is easier. You could probably solve it for VI, but let's just do it for VF. So if I do that, I have to add this term on over to the right-hand side, right? So this becomes beta times VI multiplied by change in temperature. I can't say that for some reason. I'm fumbling on that, whatever. Uh, plus then the initial volume. All right. Now, what I realize here is that I have two terms on the right-hand side with a common factor in them, right? They both have VI. So what I'm, going to do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull that out of each term. And then what I'm left with for the first term here is beta times delta T. And what I'm left with the second term is just a placeholder of one, right? So if you were to distribute this VI, you would realize you would work backward to that equation. Now this looks good to me, all right? Now what, I'm, what I realize here is that I have now an equation that relates VF to VI, okay? So since this whole thing equals VF and VF is in this formula over here, I can just do a nice little substitution, okay? So let's see what happens when we do that. We have PI VI over TI will equal then PF times now the VI times then beta delta T plus one, all divided then by the uh, final temperature, right? All then divided by the final temperature. All right. Now, mathematically speaking, I did this so I can cancel the VIs. Okay, they will cancel. They will be identical. They're both VI. They're both initial volume. And mathematically, I can cancel them. So what does this now work out to be? Well, this formula now works out. And let me just bring this work on up a little bit so I have a little more space down here. So this formula works out to now be PI over TI will equal then PF times now uh, beta delta T plus 1. Oops, where's the one? I don't know. Divided then by the uh, final temperature. Okay. Now, remember, we need to solve for the final pressure here. So simply do this. Take what's ever in the denominator on the right, move it on up into the numerator on the left. Then take the remaining term here, the numerator on the right, bring it down into the denominator on the left, and look what you just did. You just solved for the final pressure. All right, let me just make this a little nicer. So we're going to have a little division sign here. And voila, here's the formula. All we have to now do is plug stuff in. So what's the final temperature? Well, that was 333. What's the initial pressure? Remember, it has to be the absolute. So that was 1.013 times 10 to the fifth. All right, then now divide it by the beta value of glass. Well, what is it? You got to look it up. I think it's about 27 times 10 to the minus 6 per Celsius. 
And they might say, well, that's Celsius. We need it in Kelvin. No, no, no. It's, it's, the units will cancel here. The change in temperature uh, in Celsius versus Kelvin is identical. It doesn't, you know, you can ch check that for yourself. When I calculate the change uh, in temperature here, I realize that it's always the final value minus the initial value. So it's going to be a simple value of 40. I'm going to plug that in. I'm going to add 1 to it, and then multiply by Ti, which is 293. So now when I take out my handy-dandy calculator, and I plug it in, I'm going to do the denominator first, so 27 times 10 to the minus 6 times 40, add 1 to it, then take that multiply by 293, and now I get 293.31, so basically a small change. So this is then 333 on the numerator, multiplied by 1.013 times 10 to the fifth, divided then by that denominator value. We now get a value here of basically, right? I mean, we're really 1.15, you know, times 10 to the uh, fifth, right? If I'm rounding, okay? And this is in Pascals. Now remember, this is the final, this is equal to the final absolute pressure. Well, this was the final absolute pressure in the case where we took into account the volume expansion. And this was the final absolute pressure before. I mean, they're basically the same. I mean, they are the same here because I rounded. But if you really look you know, at all the decimals, they're not going to be identical. They're going to be off by a little, little, little margin. But basically an insignificant margin. Okay, it's really not off by that much whatsoever. So if the absolute pressures are the same, the gauge pressures will be uh, basically the same as well. So I would do the same calculation over here. It'll basically be the same thing. If you wanted more precision, you can go out more decimals, but then, you know, can we do that with all the sig figs? That's up to you to decide. All right. So guys, thank you very much for tuning in. Hopefully this video helps. Please remember to help us out and subscribe. We'll see you next time.